wanted to talk a little bit about um, two brands. I've been fortunate to be involved in um, the building of two brands since 97. Uh, the first one uh, was a W Hotels brand, um, which I was involved in um, in 97 and 99. And then Red Envelope, um, uh, the gift brand from 99 to current. Uh, w uh, was the first new brand that was built in the hotel industry in at that time in 17 years. The last one was Hyatt. And I was hired by Barry Sternlich, who's the chairman and CEO of Starwood Hotels and Resorts, to uh, create the W, which was at that time, no, we didn't know it was going to be called the W. Um, the interest, my interest and Barry's interest was in giving uh, – American customers who were spending a lot of time traveling for business, the ability to have a hotel that was very comfortable and had a lot of style, but still served all the needs of a business traveler, which meant that it would have conference rooms, internet access, all of the things that were important to business travelers that the boutique hotels that were doing um, a great job in style and comfort weren't serving. So uh, Barry had a real interest in what Ian Schrager was doing in New York, loved the whole spirit of the boutique hotel, um, but uh, purchased shortly after I got there Weston and Sheridan and became one of the largest hotel companies uh, and realized that there was a real need for a business hotel. So my job in developing W was to bring together the best of the style and comfort in the boutique hotels with all of the business services in a business hotel. The two years I was there, um, we designed and built the first 10 hotels for W. Uh, I think there's now getting, they're getting close to 35, so they've grown a lot since I left. In 99, I joined a tiny little dot com uh, that was doing a million dollars a year and was, when I found out when I got there, was out of money. Um, so that was my first job was to raise money to keep it alive. Uh, and it was an interesting project in a very crazy time in building a gift brand. Um, although it was a gift brand, at 911 Gifts was really focused on lower end gifts um, and really wasn't working very well. So it really became a start over from scratch brand because we changed everything from the name to the positioning uh, to bringing some money into the company so we could start to market it. And um, I guess that that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, First of all, let me let me apologize. I just read my bio, and it, it says that uh, Galaxy Desserts is just under $100 million in sales. It should say well under $100 million in sales. <laughs> so <laughs> just one small word. <laughs> and also in advance, uh, if, I, if, if, if I stutter a few times, I'm having flashbacks right next door is where in the spring of 1990, Professor Van Horn nailed me in corporate finance. So, <clears throat> so uh, I, I bought a... I bought a little company right out of Stanford in 91 called the Cheesecake Lady, which was a couple hundred thousand dollar bakery with a, with a great product and no sales force and no computers in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I bought that with money I raised uh, mostly from my classmates who got real jobs here. And I uh, grew that and paid off the debt for a few years. And in 1998, merged it with a friend of mine's bakery uh, to form Galaxy Desserts. And we had a, an idea that we could be the leading company in individual gourmet desserts. And so we decided to try and build a brand around that. We went out. We raised a uh, million dollars that first year, uh, bought equipment, started building a management team, uh, did things like build a, a monster trade show booth that we couldn't afford to try and build some trade awareness, uh, and started growing. And uh, we've been helped the last few years. We, uh, uh, we've been on Oprah a couple times. Uh, and we're working towards being brands on Oprah. The first time we were on Oprah, it was just our product, which was great for sales, but she, she uh, didn't mention our name or my partner's name, who's the chef. Uh, and then this year, we were just on her favorite thing show in November, and she mentioned his name, uh, so we're partially branded, so we're on, we're on our way uh, uh, with that. Um, we, we sell to uh, the retail trade, uh, Whole Foods, Wild Oats, Andronico's, high-end stores like that, as well as... Uh, mainstream grocers like Kroger and Safeway, uh, and uh, I was just talking to Peter here uh, and uh, about our new launch of our low-carb desserts, as we are not afraid to jump on any trend. 
<laughs> Hopefully it'll last a little than our low-fat cheesecake did a few years ago. That was really bad. Um, and looking forward to talking to you about how we've tried to build the brand. I want to say, first of all, Jim, this is a bad panel for a guy on the Atkin diet to be on here between desserts, chocolate, and beer. <laughs> and, I'm not, and I'm not trendy enough to walk in a W hotel. I'm not skinny enough. I have, so I, I'm really out of place on this. Uh, <laughs> I really feel that way about W. It's a wonderful hotel. It's all about diversity here, Pete. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a place for fat bald guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah, look. I spent my uh, professional career building brands and advertising. I spent 20 years with the Coca-Cola company, uh, ran marketing in the United States, ran the wine marketing for the company. We were in the wine business, Sterling Vineyards and others. Um, introduced Diet Coke in 50 countries around the world. I was the first head of global marketing of the Coca-Cola company and introduced a campaign called Always Coca-Cola using a Hollywood talent agent named uh, Michael Ovitz. I spent eight years with Coke when we owned Columbia Pictures, um, president of marketing and distribution, and I had to introduce a brand about every three weeks, a Tootsie or Gandhi or Stand By Me, uh, which is a really an interesting uh, uh, to try to build a brand over a, over a weekend. But I do feel I have some knowledge on that. I now teach across the bay at, um, at the Haas School, UC Berkeley. I've been there for 10 years. But I'm coming here um, in the spring quarter. And all those of you who are students, please, Marketing 392, um, Brands and Marketing Strategy. Moi is going to be teaching that. I'm anxious to, to see you there. The power of a brand, I will tell you, I, the Stanford brand, I have 14 guest lecturers coming, the head of marketing of General Motors, uh, American Airlines, uh, Wachovia Bank. The power of this brand Look at my syllabus on the uh, on coursework. It's amazing how they're all willing to come to uh, to Palo Alto. So we'll talk a little about that in the um, in the uh, 392 course. So that's my background. My name is Pete Slosberg, and I'm just a home brewer. I got dirt under my fingernails. Um, I came to the Valley 25 years ago. Worked in high tech. Uh, worked for a company called Rome, which became part of IBM, which became part of Siemens. But in the course of that, I turned my home brewing into a homebrew club at Rome. And then in 1986, uh, a friend of mine and I started Pete's Brewing Company. We had the beer company for 13 years. We became a public company, got to about $70 million in revenue, and actually produced a billion bottles of beer. A billion bottles of beer on the wall. A <laughs> uh, and then we sold it in 1998. And um, I spent two years with the acquiring company. Then I got involved with a nonprofit for a couple of years, but had the itch to do something again. And uh, on a trip to Belgium, several trips to Belgium to meet Belgian brewers, you couldn't help but find incredible chocolate in Belgium. Did some research and uh, found out that, uh, in general, chocolate in Europe was just far superior to, to uh, chocolate in the United States. And the analog uh, to the beer industry was quite striking in that Buttermiller and Coors got bigger and bigger by making blander and blander products that opened the door for us to po produce full-flavored beer. Uh, and the idea came, let's try to produce an all-American high-quality, premium, world-class chocolate bar company, and uh, actually got to work with several uh, second years at Stanford two years ago. They helped me on a business plan and identified that, sure enough, in the world of chocolate, um, even though the chocolate being about a $15 billion a year industry is flat in revenue, the premium segment is just starting to take off, similar to the way uh, craft beer took off in the mid-'80s. So we're, our bet is that we can make a, a unique set of premium chocolate bars uh, with a fun attitude. The whole attitude with the beer company was produce a world-class product but have fun with it. And we're trying to replicate that in the world of beer. So um, sorry to be the only one doing this, but I actually brought samples. Um, we'll, pass this. This, we'll pass this around. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm passing around is sort of like my bridge back to the beer business. One of our products we call Maltimus Maximus. It's a real brewer's malt and a malt crunchy and a darker milk chocolate, 36% cacao. So we, we jokingly call it a malt ball on steroids. <laughs> and today is a good day for both talking about business and talking about beer. I was a beer judge this morning in San Francisco judging barley wines, so I feel in great shape now to talk about <laughs> whatever. But since, Hillary, you're sitting so close to me, why don't we start here? Uh, you had two brands that you were involved in, so I thought maybe we'd talk first a little bit just about um, Red Envelope. Say, this is kind of a you know, kind of a crazy time, a cluttered space and so on. What were some of the brand marketing techniques that you used to help create that brand and get it to stand out? 
Well, it was an interesting time. Um, I think one of the challenge, most challenging parts of developing the, the Red Envelope brand was in the dot-com time, there was this um, interest in building a brand as fast as possible. And there was a lot of money in the market. So it was – we raised our first uh, round of funding – in the summer of 99, and we're pretty much asked to go spend it as quickly as possible um, and to build a brand very quickly. Um, I, it, was a, it was a crazy time, and a lot of the uh, peers of mine who are also running dot-com companies were taking, you know, a lot of millions of dollars and running Super Bowl ads. I think you, you know, saw those. And, um, and we're sort of going into the one-shot big moment marketing campaigns to try to build their brand. Our feeling was that Red Envelope needed to become more than just a dot-com brand. Um, I thought that being online was a great place to start the brand, but that ultimately to be a great specialty retail brand, it needed to be anywhere the customer wanted it to be. And that long term, we we launched a catalog shortly after we uh, launched our site. Um, and long term, I believe that we will have stores and have a comprehensive brand. Um, and so we looked at, at at the marketing opportunities differently than most of our, our peer group companies. We didn't look at it as being quite as much of a rush to build a brand overnight and thought about it um, a little, hopefully, uh, uh, more, more thoughtfully. We also looked for areas where we could market our brand where all the other dot-coms weren't, which was sort of hard because they were everywhere. The one place that they weren't was in lifestyle magazines that we thought was important in targeting our customer. And so we ran um, full-page ads in The New Yorker, uh, InStyle magazine, Oprah's magazine, um, many magazines that were both fashion, home, lifestyle uh, magazines. And that was a surprisingly uncrowded space. It also was a lot cheaper than television advertising, which is what a lot of the companies were doing. Uh, We avoided radio because radio was really crowded. We avoided TV, obviously, because it was expensive and crowded. Um, And we really focused on on the lifestyle magazines primarily, uh, as well as our marketing um, programs we had with the major portals uh, online. Um, And I think that, you know, even today people talk about the magazine ads. They remember them, although they're now two years old. Um, I think it really helped position the brand in a unique way uh, during a very crowded time. Mm -hmm. Well... Uh, first thing is we were two very small brands, uh, which certainly limited the challenges as there was large parts of the country that had never heard of either of us. Um, that's good news and the bad news. Uh, what we did is uh, we, we uh, communicated the hell out of everyone, customers, vendors. Uh, for about a year, we used all three names. We said, uh, we officially said Galaxy Desserts, Home of Paris Delights, and the Cheesecake Lady. It was on our, our phone system. It was on our letterhead. It was on our packaging. So that lasted for about a year, and then we transitioned into a new logo and dropped, uh, dropped, the, dropped the other names. Um, so it was a combination of, of um, just massive communication, PR, and we really we focused on the trade. Uh, so we, we didn't have enough presence to be a recognizable consumer brands, so... Uh, at trade shows and in a little bit of trade advertising and any editorial coverage we could get through our, our PR people, uh, we told the story and we tried to get the name Galaxy out there as much as we as we could. So there was there's some confusion. Uh, there's always confusion with change, uh, and I you know there's probably a small number of, of people who still send me mail to the wrong company name. But uh, after about six months, uh, it was uh, it was done with the people who knew us. And and they knew that we were Galaxy, and uh, we were able to go forward from there and forget about trying to incorporate three different names. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, Peter, Peter Seeley, uh, you've had a wide variety of experience with building brands here. I remember that always Coca-Cola line. Isn't it true that we have to pay you six cents each time we use that? I line? wish I had the merchandising rights of the polar bears. I'd yeah. be, uh, you know, I would be living, you know, in the south of France if I had that. Uh, you know. <laughs> so um, you've probably experienced lots of these different uh, kinds of brands. Are there any common pitfalls in brand building? I mean, things that you would warn people to look out for in this process of building brands? 
Jim, there are many. Uh, there's a lot more ways to screw up with a brand than there is to build one successfully. I'll give you one that uh, most of the MBAs in this room were just about being born when it took place, and that was the introduction and massive failure of new Coke in this country in 1985, <laughs> probably the greatest marketing blunder of the past uh, probably 35, 40 years. Was that you? I was in Hollywood. I was. Uh, <laughs> now I also was in Hollywood marketing a film called Ishtar at the time, so I had <laughs> gone the Tootsie, but I had mine too. Um, <laughs> new Coke, the stuff in that red can, um, does not taste as good as Pepsi Cola. Blind taste test, Pepsi wins, always had. The two men running Coke at that time, one was an Argentinian, one was in Mexico, they came up with a new formulation. In fact, it was Diet Coke introduced in 1983, a sugar form that actually began to beat Pepsi in blind taste test. It was, you know, happy times in Atlanta because for the first time they had a product that looked like it was demonstrably superior to Pepsi Cola. The issue, Jim, and the reason Coke was such a, and I cannot describe to you the massive extent of the failure. It was in 30 days, the largest consumer product in the United States was literally going off the marketplace. The, the outcry, there was an old Coke lovers club. People were pouring new Coke down the drains. McDonald's <laughs> was going crazy. The issue was, Jim, the Coca-Cola company did not have permission to change the formula of Coca-Cola, or at least to announce it and put new improved on it. That product was invented by a pharmacist in Atlanta, Georgia in 1886, and it is beloved by people. They, they own it more than the Coca-Cola company does. You can improve a Sony DVD. You can improve a BMW 530i. You can't improve an Icon. You can't improve Budweiser beer. The formulation recipe has changed, but you'll never see August 4 putting new, better tasting Bud, a snipe on it. And that was probably an, an example of where a company literally misjudges the power it has to change. It was a logical decision. Tasted better. Trust me, it tasted better. Still does. But the company did not have permission. You have to understand what the consumer will give you permission to do. I'll give you a prediction right now, another one. Porsche is making a massive mistake with an SUV, Cayenne, $78,000 front-wheel drive, turbocharged V8, 4,700-pound, enormous mistake. That is not Porsche. When you violate what a brand stands for, as they did with a 928 earlier, it will be a failure. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, Pete. Um, You've had experience in building brands that are tied to yourself, to your own personality and image. What are some of the challenges that are associated with building the, the personal brand, the involving the founder himself into the brand identification of the company? Well, when you got a guy this good looking, it's really... <laughs> not... you got to go with your strength, right? <laughs> the, one, the one string. <laughs> what... What we did from day one with the beer was uh, we, my partner and I, his name is Mark Bronder, um, uh, we decided that we liked what Ben and Jerry had done with ice cream, what Debbie Field did with cookies, that, that when there's an identified person, people get behind that person in general. So uh, it turned out with the beer, uh, I thought we'd call it Mark and Pete's Brewing Company or Pete and Mark's Brewing Company, but just as a side note, Mark has never had any alcohol to this day, and at, at the last minute, he decided not to put his name on it. So I said, fine, we'll call it Pete's. He, he's regretted that. <laughs> uh, in, 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 in the course of getting our label out, we actually didn't put a person behind it other than the name. Although the role I took, the role I really liked was getting out there in front of wholesalers, retailers, and consumers, not promoting Pete's Brewing, far from it, but promoting better beer. The, the craft beer category. My feeling was if you got the whole tide to rise with our marketing and sales capability, we'd take more than our fair share. And it wasn't really until like uh, 1996, 97 that our marketing folks decided that it was important to actually get my mug on the label uh, just to identify that there is a real person behind it. Um, but I think uh, our foresight in having a real person to be identified with combined with the fact that the role I took was not to run it day to day, we actually brought in outside people to run the company. And my partner, Scott, just took off a little while ago to go to another, to go to another seminar. He was the last president of Pete's Brewing Company. And it's one, one of the core decisions was not to 
to let our egos get in the way of doing the right business decisions. And the, the thing I like doing was being on the outside, not running day to day. So we brought outside people in. Um, in the course of starting the chocolate company, what we saw was successful in the beer company, and that is having a real person, identified real person, uh, helped. So our bet is with the chocolate company that we try to do it uh, the same way. Now, the risk to that is, of course, the the truck out there, what happens if the truck comes by. Uh, but that's that can always happen. But uh, the reaction so far with the chocolate company, even though we're still in our infancy, is that as wholesalers and retailers and consumers get to know there's a real person behind it, it generates a lot more interest. And certainly with the press, it's for PR perspective, it's a great, great. Um, each of you has been involved in more than one product category or industry with respect to branding. So I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit on maybe some of the differences in brand building in one industry versus another. So, Pete, since you've been involved in both beer and chocolate, are there any differences or are there kind of generalizable things that are this, you found that are the same regardless of the category? Well, from, from a brief exposure about being in the market about a year and doing a lot of in-store samplings, uh, one of the core differences is from the consumer perspective is beer tended to be about two-thirds male, one-third female. Chocolate tends to be about just the opposite, two-thirds female, one-third male. Uh, we made an overt effort in the course of starting the chocolate company not to identify that I had a relationship with the beer. We sold the beer company five years ago. The, the brand has gone in the toilet. I was afraid of being associated with it. But what we found in the last, uh, well, in the last six to nine months is when people find out that I was associated with the beer and there was a lot of credibility way back when with the beer, they are more attuned to trying the, the chocolate product mm -hmm. because they identified that Pete's, Pete's Wicked Ale had high quality. And then if I created that, creating a chocolate, they're willing to try it more. So uh, we're, we're, we're now starting to identify more with my background being involved with the beer just because it, it, set, it set a good standard in the beer. Now people expect uh, that we're going to be producing a great chocolate and we deliver on that. Okay. So, Peter, same question for you. Um, maybe a contrast between the instant brand building of movies versus the long-standing brand tradition of a Coke, or can you reflect on any either differences or similarities? Yeah, many are the same, Jim. I mean, the, the awareness and image of the brand, what it stands for, its promise, its personality, its attitude, those things are consistent. The way people accept marketing is vastly different. Uh, when I was in the wine business, we uh, Coke owned Sterling Vineyards up in Napa Valley. You really can't advertise a premium $30 a bottle Cabernet, even if you could afford to. People like to discover products like that. They're, they're unique. I think some, those of you who live around here, uh, uh, a chain that does a volume about 50% higher than McDonald's per store does no advertising. It's called In-N-Out Burger. It's a, it's a discovered brand. People have a language to talk about. Howard Schultz built uh, Starbucks basically without advertising. I was with uh, Larry Page on Friday at, at Google. Google's been built without advertising, not a single ad for, for Google. So it, Coke has to have advertising. So when I introduced Coke into China, I had to advertise Coke. It wasn't a matter of always Coca-Cola. It's a real thing. It's drink Coca-Cola cold. They, they didn't understand that you had to chill the beverage. And if you want something bad, you drink a warm Coke. It's not. So you've got to understand the ethos of a brand. Should you advertise? How much should you advertise? I did some testing at Columbia. I actually proved that I did some match cities and increased the ad level of various films. You can advertise a movie too much. People literally think it's becoming uh, forced on them, they, that you literally have a diminished box office with higher advertising. So be careful about what your brand stands for. Are you a Coca-Cola? Are you a Google? Are you an In-N-Out Burger? And make those decisions of how you advertise in a very brand-specific way. All right, now, Paul, you've been kind of in one industry, so let me ask you this question. Cheesecake and moose cake. All right. <laughs> I mean, there are big differences there that I'm not aware of. <laughs> Give me some credit. <laughs> <laughs> so what about this? In getting started up, is there ever a danger that you would underspend in creating a brand? I mean, there must be a lot of uses that you could put that $1 million to that you raised. How do you know how much to devote and... Is there ever that kind of pressure that you won't do it? Well, from, from, from starting at such a small level and 
uh, being the guy who signs the checks, it, it's, it's hard to spend anything on something intangible. And building a brand uh, as, as compared to hiring another salesperson or you know, doing something you put your finger on it is really scary when, when you can see how quickly you can spend that million dollars. Um, so it's something, it's something we forced ourselves to do. And it hurt every step of the way. Uh, but uh, you know what we did is uh, we took we took fifty thousand dollars and built our trade show booth, uh, things like that. We we did uh, we took a hundred thousand dollars and spent it on packaging and packaging development and creating the logo, and you know, all, all of a sudden that million dollars starts going starts going like that, and it's and there's nothing immediately to uh, uh, to show that hey that was really that was a good idea. I'm glad we did that. Uh, in retrospect, thank God we did it. I wish we had spent a little bit more. Because I think uh, um, the difference between building a brand in three years and building a brand in 20 years is how much you can spend on it. You have to spend wisely, um, and uh, I think we did that uh, to a large extent. Uh, but it's you know when you've got limited resources, uh, it, it's a hard choice. It's a hard choice. Everybody's asking for it. Yeah. It still and it still is. You know even we've got we've got more money and it's it, it's still. Uh, you know, to, to do those extra trade shows or to buy some advertising, it's it's. Uh, so let me ask you this: How would you know the money's well spent? Is there one thing you looked, an objective you set that you could look back and say, "This is what we hoped we would get out of this brand creation." I was in Florida last week and on vacation, and went into a grocery store with my kids and saw Galaxy desserts and went to the bakery manager. And asked her about it. And she was like, "Oh yeah, great." And she, you know, she she mentioned Oprah. She mentioned the lava cake, and she mentioned some some of the things about the company. And you know, th far away from home in a, in a market that we don't get to all that much, uh, you know, that told me that we've been successful mm -hmm. with the message. Yeah. Great. All right now, Hillary, one of the things you've done is you've been at Red Envelope and also the W brand. One of the differences was that the W brand had to be grown out of a kind of a larger context. Mm -hmm. What were the challenges associated with building a new brand inside of a, an existing brand in an industry that might have been maybe a little bit resistant to that? Yeah, that was uh, – I had come to uh, do the W Project from, from Pottery Barn. I was running product development and design uh, for them. And that was a similar situation in, in that Williams-Sonoma bought Pottery Barn and then the Pottery Barn brand started growing as a sub-brand. The difference at W was that there was not a lot of interest inside the company about creating this brand except for from Barry, <laughs> who ran the company, so they didn't have a choice, and me. <laughs> Um, and I was lucky because my team was in San Francisco where the main corporate headquarters was in White Plains. But shortly after I got there, as I said before, Weston and Sheridan were purchased under the Starwood umbrella. And the whole idea of building a concept like W was really unpopular. Um, at, uh, and what I found was that the hotel industry really didn't like change. And so at W, when we started talking about wanting cotton sheets and wanting down products and wanting to take that ugly vinyl off the walls and actually paint the walls, the amount of resistance was enormous because it was new and it was different and it had never done, been done before. And there was a tremendous concern that it was going to be too hard for the hotels to maintain this new look and feel. Um, and I think had W sort of started from scratch without any of the uh, any of that history and any of that um, all those concerns, uh, we would have been able to get a lot done a lot faster. Um, but what I did learn was that there was a big benefit in being inside of an industry that hadn't changed for a long time and had gotten into a formula because a lot of the formula had merit. Um, we would find that we would walk down the hallway and our beautifully painted walls suddenly had big black scuff marks everywhere, which is what, you know, vinyl covering doesn't, you don't have that problem. And there was real issues with cotton sheets weighing down the machines and they had to get new washing machines and down had all kinds of maintenance issues with it. So what I learned was being, understanding where the source of the resistance came from and working in collaboration with the project managers and the hotel managers to build a product that was completely new but didn't blow up all the infrastructures that were supporting this business over many, many, many years. 
Ultimately, I think made W a lot more successful um, because I think we would have made a lot of mistakes had we just, you know, been completely out of the box and done everything completely new. Um, w was really a collaboration between um, doing things that were comfortable for a big brand hotel with a very innovative point of view in terms of design, and that allowed W to roll out very quickly. So the fact that W has been able to build so many hotels very quickly has had a lot to do with building um, the basics that really worked for the hotel business as opposed to just saying, well, we'll we're just going to do it a new way. Um, and that was it was frustrating, but it was also, I think, very important. You've all been... Uh played a role in building brands and thinking about the challenges associated with building brands. Um, what do you think are some of the most interesting trends in brand building? What's going on out there? Who's doing a great job of building brands, and, and how are they doing it? I'll jump in and say I think one of the big things happening now, I gave a speech in L.A. on Wednesday at the L.A. Ad Club, is the death of advertiser-supported television as we know it and its diminution as a force in creating brands or even sustaining existing brands. It's happening, and I think uh, to the MBAs in the room, you guys are going to live in a world where you're going to do brand building fundamentally differently than when yours truly got out of graduate school at Yale. I went to work for the Procter & Gamble Company. That was an era when America sat down at 9 o'clock at night 90% of America was tuned to one of three television channels. They did not have a remote control. You had 60-second commercials. They were galvanized. They were looking at it. I mean, they gathered around. Uh, they, they had TV dinners. They ate looking at this thing. And you segue from that world to the world of uh, TiVo, where 70% of television viewing is no longer live and 80% of pod-based commercials are, are omitted. You guys are going to have to learn how to introduce and market products without ad-supported television. Um, I'll give you an example. Last year, probably the best example of a product introduction without television, my wife has one, is the BMW Mini Automobile. It is unprecedented to introduce a new car in the United States of America without using television. But they did. Guerrilla marketing. They put a Mini on top of a GMP, GMC Suburban and drove it around. So, and the people were galvanized, guerrilla marketing. Um, they communicated with people. It was just a marvelous introduction. So get ready for the world of non-TV-driven brand building and brand-sustained marketing. Uh, I think another key trend is the middle class wants luxury without the trappings of luxury. Mm -hmm. Look at what BMW is doing with the three class, what Mercedes is doing with their low-end class. Uh, people want finer goods, but they don't want all the trappings of uh, gold foil and all the other <coughs> usual stuff. Uh, I think that's a key trend uh, in people wanting better but not being so uh, hoity-toity, so to speak. I think it's, I think it's amazing uh, with all the people on low-carb diets how unbelievably successful Krispy Kreme Donuts has been. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. You know, other extreme. And people... people it, it's such a hot brand. You see uh, co <clears throat> terrible companies like Albertsons trying to use Krispy Kreme donuts to improve their brand. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm obviously very narrowly focused, but I think that's an awesome brand. <laughs> <laughs> and they're great. <laughs> Can you explain how you think they have overcome what should be this underlying trend of resistance against Well, the I, I, they're, they're, they've, they've generated, and I don't know, how, I honestly have no idea how they generated such tremendous buzz. I mean, they're you know they've got the buzz, they've got the hot you know the hot thing. Uh, they also you know they also have a little bit of uh, I think the entertainment factor. You see that in in, uh, in popular and successful restaurant chains now too. It's not just not just eating; it's the experience. And for the Krispy Kreme donuts, you know you're not just getting you're not just getting a normal donut. You're getting you're getting a little bit of theater, and you're getting experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good stuff here. I don't know what to add. I think the interesting things with brand is is how radically everything's changing. Peter talked about television advertising going away. We're seeing in specialty retail that specialty retailers that have lots of stores are being blown away by how many of their customers are moving to the web, and they're suddenly worried about what they're going to do with all this expensive real estate that they've invested in. That's a huge shift, and it's happening. I mean, you talk to companies, they can't believe how many of their customers are moving to the web without any incentive. Um, so the markets are shifting. There is a huge interest in honest, simple brands like Krispy Kreme 
There is amazing things happening in the luxury sector. I mean, people, you know, Gucci got taken over, Burberry got taken over, Coach got taken over. They are some of the most exciting brands happening right now, and they're old, stodgy luxury brands that have just been completely reinvented. So everywhere you look, in all sectors, um, there's a tremendous amount of change, and <coughs> one small catalyst creates an enormous ripple. Um, at W, you know, we now have Marriott worrying about their polyester comforters. Um, <laughs> that was a dollar comforter. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> the, 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 Just don't worry. Yeah, Marriott's spraying down on my head <laughs> because they're doing down comforters. And they're, I mean, the hot, hotel industry, the major big brands are completely changing. Um, so small, you know, small catalysts are creating enormous change across industries, um, which I think is really interesting to see just the pace of change and how many brands are evolving and how much the market is moving. And Jim, there's a bifurcation going on. You'll see people having a, you know, a 400 calorie galaxy dessert and, and making up for that by drinking Diet Coke. Uh, you see people. <laughs> you'll see people going to Andronicos or, or Dragers uh, and paying, you know, for top of the line stuff, and also pushing a big metal card at, at Costco and buying bathroom tissue in 24 uh, pack rolls with a Mercedes S500 outside. Uh, an interesting mixture of uh, really of, of both frugality and logic and illogic. So you, it's, it's not a world you can say, you know, I'm just going to have a, it used to be a single solution. It's not anymore. Right. Can you, can you sell a C-Class Mercedes for $29,000 and an S600 AMG for $135,000 in the same dealership? They are fundamentally different automobiles. And I, I don't know how far you can stretch. BMW is introducing a two-class, two-series BMW, a, 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 and looking at a one-series. So you have seven, five, you know, uh, three, two, one. I don't think you can stretch that puppy that far. It begins to be, what the hell do you stand for as a brand? Yeah, for us, it's it, word of mouth. Discovery is the, it's the only way to go. Americans don't buy into advertising in general now. Mm -hmm. So it's, they, they trust their friends when their friends tell them, I, I found something good. So what we did with the beer was a lot of beer tastings, a lot of unique things uh, to generate word of mouth, and we're applying the same principles to getting the chocolate out there. Yeah, ab absolutely. We, we spend we spend money on PR for, I mean, for that reason. Uh, you know, If someone can write a story about, it, about yeah. us in the third person and get our message across... People will believe that, and they won't believe any type of advertising. So we, we actively try to do that. I think, you know, when we looked at, when we built the Red Envelope brand, we thought deeply about the gift-giving experience in America. And what's interesting when you look at it, Americans are terrible gift givers. And there's, we have so much pressure and obligation that we've piled on top of ourselves. Um, and we have all these Hallmark holidays and, you know, God help you if you don't get the right gift for your mom, and then you have to get someone for Valentine's Day. We have all this pressure, and so for the giver and the recipient, there's not enough joy and spontaneity in the process. And when you look around the world, gift giving is much more what you'd want it to be because it's a spontaneous gesture. They don't have all these holidays that create all this anxiety. So what we focus on, I mean, I think, you know, we talk about building brands, and I, and I truly believe that your, the innovation of your product and really addressing a customer need the way nobody else is will build your business faster than any piece of advertising you could do. And at, and at Red Envelope, all of our products we design ourselves, and we think a lot about the gift game experience. We worry about what's a good sympathy gift. You cannot buy a sympathy gift out there, and it's important for people. What is a Mother's Day gift should it be? I mean, if you look at most Mother's Day gifts, they've got moms trapped in this outdated idea of what a mother was in the 1950s. You know, so what does a modern mother really want for a gift? And we create those gifts because the market really is, is out of step, um, partly because gift, gifting is not a big focus for most companies. 
And so I think what brings people back is the fact that we're really rele relevant for them in the gifts that we offer, and that they're not gifts that you can buy anywhere else, and that they serve uh, the modern Americans' needs in, in what they want for, for gifts for people. I would say the best in your industry, the best example of doing that really well is Patagonia. Um, I mean, it's it, it built as the top of the line sporting equipment that was the most expensive you can buy, but there's nothing alienating about that brand. It's the most welcoming brand, and they've done incredibly well because their product, once you wear their product, there's no going back. Um, and so I think that it can be done, but I, th I think Pete talked about the trappings of luxury brands, and I think those are very damaging to a brand because you don't want people to feel like they only have access to your brand if they're really rich or they look a certain way, you know. And we, we, I know at W, really tried hard to avoid the problem that Peter says because, you know, Ian Schrager's brand was yeah. came out of the Studio 54, which is, you know, lining up for a club and the bouncer would look at you and decide if you were hip enough to get in. People don't want that, you know. It, they don't. They want to feel like they can, if they love a brand, they can access a brand, they can be comfortable there. I urge you to think about. It. I think a brand has three things: it has a positioning, what it stands for; it has a personality, that kind of what it what it what it looks like to you. It also has an attitude, and an attitude about a brand is what you think the brand thinks about you. And most people don't think to that level. Brands have attitudes, and. If, if you have a brand, I know certain brands exclude me. I, I really feel they do. Forget about the rational economics. And so give some consideration to that as to what, what, it, what are you projecting in that, uh, in that case in terms of the attitude of your brand towards the customer. We, we never owned manufacturing capability. It was a core principle of our beer company and our chocolate company. From day one, it was outsourced. Um, Two things about outsourcing. Number one is it frees up capital for sales and marketing, which is important to us. Number two, the quality controls of an outsourced partner are going to be far and away 10 times, 20 times, 100 times superior to what you can afford in a small company. Mm -hmm. So we had much better quality of our product. We had much better ability to ramp up production, and we could use the freed up resources for sales and marketing. A lot of other people in the craft beer industry kind of pointed at us and say, you're not a real brewer, you're, you're contract brewing. And really the only people who did that were other brewers who had to have their own deal with the, having their own factories. It, we never had contract manufacturing as a real issue with consumers. They were interested in your product and the way you present the product. I'm a proponent of global branding. I mean, I, I feel strongly that to be the case. For companies that do not do that, Procter & Gamble, I think, really only has about two global brands, Head & Shoulders one. Uh, Tide is not sold in Europe. Uh, I think as we become more and more globalized, you get more and more homogenized. I can recall Bob Whaling, head of marketing of, of uh, Procter & Gamble, selling Head & Shoulders in, in Arabic countries where the men had headdresses on, and he had to show them the dandruff was just itchiness. He couldn't show dandruff because they, and, and those things. I had a commercial on, on uh, Coke Always, a dog digging a bone out of the ground, and I couldn't show that commercial in Islamic countries. You adapt, but the benefits of, a, if you've got a consistent product around the world, the benefits of a global brand are tremendous, I believe. Uh, just being a small company, uh, the, the thought of a global brand. We're trying to make a Northern California success. <laughs> and if we think about anything outside of the country, it's a waste of time. And I look at it, and I think you have some, some trust marks that float over. Starwood, to me, is a trust mark. It sits over the luxury collection, Sheridan, Weston, W, so on. Uh, the Ford Motor Company is a trust mark, a master brand that sits on top of Aston Martin, Jaguar, Volvo, Ford, Mercury, Lincoln. And I think the best companies have that, you know, I, someone spending $240,000 for an Aston Martin, I think they kind of are happy that that's a car of the Ford Motor Company because they only make a few thousand of them a year. So I think you can have a Procter & Gamble does that. I mean, it's that trust mark, mm -hmm. Sears. Uh, you know, you've Craftsman tools, but it's a part of Sears. When you do those two in combination, a trust mark and a brand-specific product mark, I think that's the best combination. We're having that internal uh, discussion right now because uh, in launching our low-carb line, we're, it's already so big and we're expecting it to be so big, we're giving it its own, its own brand name. They're called Dream Cakes. So we're going through the whole process of 
creating creating an image for that, and uh, we're split as to whether we should be doing it because uh, it's hard enough building one brand, and we almost feel like we're building a second brand. Um, so I'm not sure we're doing the right thing. But we'll see. We knew that uh, our bet was that craft beers would take off. We were early. Uh, we thought it would the whole segment would take off. And that in, if you go down a beer aisle, there may have been 100 beers in 1986 when we started. We, we viewed that as two to three to 400 beers, you know, five to ten years out as, as we expected the whole segment to grow. What does a consumer do when they go down the aisle? Their eyes flip back and forth. They look for colors. They look for shapes. They look for names. And it was one of the core, one of the key first decisions we had to make was what is the name besides personalizing it, what adjective are we going to use? And we were lucky we heard a comedian on a San Francisco radio station use Wicked and we liked it. But what happened was over time when I'd asked people all around the country, why did you try Pete's Wicked Ale, whether you liked it or not, why did you try it for the first time? And they, 99 of 100 people told me when they saw the name Wicked, they had to try it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh, n- names are interesting. When I was at Pottery Barn, there was a huge debate because Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel actually grew up side by side in the 50s. In fact, the two companies were very interlinked. And Crate and Barrel, they literally put their product on crates and barrels. That's where the name came from. At Pottery Barn, it was literally pottery in stores that looked like barns. That's why it was called Pottery Barn. <laughs> and so as the two companies grew, we started becoming furniture companies that had nothing to do with pottery, and Crate and Barrel didn't have anything to do with crates and barrels anymore. Although, actually, they still have crates in their stores just for fun. But there was lots of debate about Banana Republic was having the same debate at the same time around, okay, now we have nothing to do with Banana Republic you know, clothing. Those brands stood for the product, and the name almost didn't matter. I mean, you don't, when you think about Pottery Barn, you don't think about Pottery Barns anymore. Um, however, there can, names can be negative. I had that um, situation with Red Envelope because our original name was 911gifts.com. Mm-hmm. And talk about a debate. That was such a debate because it was considered to be the perfect dot-com name because in those days you, you always did a number because the number rose top on the search engines. You always had to say exactly what you did. I don't know if you remember those days, but it was garden.com, toys.com, you know, everything was, you know. So it was the perfect name as far as dot-coms were considered because it started with the number, so it just rose to the search engines and it had gifts. It was a terrible name from, from a consumer perspective because it had so many negative connotations. And this was before September 11th. You can imagine what would have happened if we kept the name. Um, and we had big debates about that name being negative enough that it was going to be a barrier for that company to grow. Um, but when we changed the name to Red Envelope, there was a lot of criticism that, well, what does that mean? No one knows what that means. Um, I think if you're in, a, in the position to be able to start a company thinking about the name, it's a really nice place to be. The issue, though, is I believe you don't want a name to trap you too much. Pottery mm-hmm. Barn's a perfect example. You know, the name worked really well when they were selling pottery in barns, but it didn't work well as they evolved as a business. Um, and so I think names can be limiters sometimes, um, but often um, if, the, if the product and the brand and what you stand for is great, in most cases it doesn't really matter what the name of the company is. I think you can judge when you got a great name is when the consumer takes it on and modifies it. It took uh, Fred Smith, I don't know how many years, to rename the company FedEx. Uh, Coke was not created by the Coca-Cola company. It was created by consumers. Mickey D's for McDonald's is, came out of the kids. When people do that, then, boy, go with it. I mean, you know, you, that's, that's when they take, they have an affection for it. And beyond the, 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 just the, the trademark, you've got a logo, you've got a shape, you've got a symbol. Is it Colonel Sanders? Is it the Mercedes star? Is it when I rent a car, I'm going down the escalator, I look for the gold. I mean, because I know that's hurt. A sound like Intel inside. You've got to surround those, just the brand with those other trappings that people begin to identify. The contour shape for Coca-Cola is a, is a trademark, you know, incredible value. So not only just the name itself, but the trappings of that. At Coke, I would in, it, uh, greet new employees with a, um, a sign in back of me. Well, I'd greet them every, uh, every six months. And at a big Coca-Cola logo, I misspelled Coca-Cola deliberately. It was Coca-Cola. 20 years, no one ever said, uh, excuse me, Mr. Seeley, you made a typo up there on the name because they weren't looking at eight letters. They were looking at a, at a visual image. It literally did not, could not see a, a, a typo. 
that's a brand that has entered the consumer's psyche in a, in a more fundamental way. It's, it's beyond the letters of the English language. That's what you want to go for. It's a, it's a huge <laughs> issue. I mean, talk about, talk about a limiting brand. I bought a company called the Cheesecake Lady. So that was me for... <laughs> so no wonder it was hard to grow for a while. Cross-dressing so. was hard to grow. <laughs> Every day. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a problem. You and the church lady, right? So, so, so having the opportunity when we, when we put the merger together to come up with a new company name was great. I mean, it was, it was liberating. And <laughs> in, in a different way. Simplified your world. <laughs> I would love to try to convince Eric and Larry and Sergey that they're now about to enter a marketing battle. Google mm -hmm. now, uh, Terry Simmel announced last week uh, Yahoo is dropping um, Google as their search engine. It is a matter of time till AOL does the same. The evil empire in the north, you know Gates has got the, the engineers that work on it. It's going to be a tremendous battle now, and I think becoming a branding and marketing battle. So respectfully, I would tell them, get ready, because I'll guarantee you, it's now going to escalate beyond just the pure superiority of the product. You cannot maintain product superiority long term in a technology area in the modern world. I'd go with a descriptive brand at that point, name, Roto-Rooter. I mean, it kind of says what it, you know, is in those low interest categories, these guys are lucky. You, you too, you're old, you're a current company. People will write about your company. There are people that write about beers, tastings, and, and desserts. When you're in a category, people don't write about plumbing services. I mean, there's no <laughs> magazine covering, you know, new developments and clearing out drain pipes. You, you know, well, you don't have those, you know, you don't have that ability to use public relations and other people, right? You've got to have a name and a focus that just literally signals what you do, I think. I think you can also really build a brand within your trade, uh, whatever the trade is, so that people in your trade know whatever it is you want them to know, whether it's you're the best or you're the cheapest, but that's a, a good way to get the name out there. And how do you do that? Uh, do it, you can do it through trade shows, do it through uh, agreements with the right people, education. Uh, it's a lot of pound on the pavement, but it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost guerrilla branding, uh, to, not to the end consumer, but to the people who are going to refer you or refer the customers. AdWords search on Google. I mean, there's a case where somebody's got, you know, stopped up pipes and right. on Google, and Google boom, you can buy your way up to the first listing. It's, you want to pay a buck, they'll give you the first listing. I think, I think um, the closest I've come to thinking about that kind of business that doesn't isn't sexy, as you said, is um, in a funny way the, what Web Van did when it was still alive. And it was, you know, they had these vans that you would notice. They painted them these great colors. The Web <coughs> Van guys that would come in were, like, incredibly friendly, and they had these big tubs that were really recognizable. I mean, I think there's a lot of tools in those industries that can catch attention because you're in neighborhoods and have a personality that's really distinctive and becomes the brand um, uh, that really could differentiate your company or any company from other companies that may not have the same brand sex appeal but has its own ability to brand itself. Not only are you introducing a new, new brand every couple of weeks, you don't know how good your competition is. I mean, at least when you were designing W, you knew your competition. You introduced a product into the existing marketplace. It's dependent upon the film itself. I, I remember one with Richard Pryor. It was called Jojo Dance Your Life is Calling. It was a terrible story. He made us made of his life. It was He was into cocaine. There were scenes of him getting granules of cocaine off the floor. And it was a depressing, <laughs> ugly movie. And I had my marketing director sell it as a comedy. They were like, Three, <laughs> three smiles in the movie, and she cut the trailer to that. I had another movie called Stand By Me, written by Richard uh, Stephen King, about four young boys going to find a, a, a dead body. None of the boys at that time were well known. We couldn't tell people, even it was written by Stephen King. We, we sold it, uh, it was a, an evocative kind of, uh, you know, what's my favorite product? Pez, cherry flavored Pez. It was a kind of a, a, a symbolic sell. So sometimes you sell away from the movie, sometimes you sell a star, sometimes if you've got a sequel, you, you, you've got it built in. It's a good thing you didn't sell the blueberry pie eating contest. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I have Bob Lackey, who runs marketing at Anheuser-Busch, coming to Marketing 392. I want to have him explain to the class how he had a flatulent horse on the Super Bowl and actually made a <laughs> commercial out of that for a, a beverage product. <laughs> 
I can't remember the yeah. runner-up. I, I, I remember uh, uh, brainstorming, uh, and we test. We must have tested it with at most twenty-five people, and everybody liked it, so we went with it. I have no idea what the runner-up was. In our case, it, we you were interesting. Peter's talking about it's about the name and the logo. I have a thing where I can't stand logos. I just think it's like one more. People have like the name and then the logo, and it's so busy. So I said to Barry, "Can we just not have a logo?" He said, "No, they, you know, not in the hotel industry. It has to have a logo." So he came one day. He said, "I've got a great idea. I come up with a name that's also a logo. I want to call it the W." And I, it was just one of those things where I said, that's perfect, um, because it fixed the problem. The W is the name and the logo. And you were talking about you know, brands that have affection. People call it the W. I mean, they have mm -hmm. an affection for the way they, they mm -hmm. so it worked. At Red Envelope, we said we wanted to have a name that had to do with gift giving, but that was mysterious and that, you know, that, was, something, that was something meaningful about gifts. So we all, it was just a group of people in the company, actually. We had a naming company. That was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that works. Did not work for us. And our head of merchandising um, was a woman who had escaped with her family from Vietnam, and she told us a story about the red envelope mm -hmm. and the Asian tradition of the red envelope. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to, I mean, there was 20 people in the room. People were practically in tears. I mean, mm -hmm. she told the story in such a beautiful way mm -hmm. that we just said, that's us. That, that's our name. Um, what was interesting in that time was then we had to fight for the name because every name was taken. I don't know if you remember that. So, you know, <laughs> the, what we fell in love with the name. The hard part was actually getting the name and, uh, you know, being able to use it. I don't think there's a great distinction. I mean, I, you know, you're, you're, the hotel industry is uh, essentially a service industry. You, you still have what you stand for, what your promise is. I mean, it's not, it is not distinctly different than a physical product. Um, you know, I think of, uh, you know, I, I just don't think there's any difference, really. Anybody else? I, you know. I do, any any ex-Bain employees here in the room? I, I worked uh, for Bain back in the in the mid-'80s when it was young and service company, but there was there was definitely an attitude behind the Bain brand, and that's that's what we pushed and got reinforced. We, we had to watch videos, so we understood what, you know, what the, what the brand meant and what the company was all about. I think in service companies, the, the people become the product. And so mm -hmm. that's you know, a big part of, mm -hmm. of what you are selling as your brand, is the mm -hmm. people that are providing the service become your product. So in other words, you're saying that you, you need to instill a certain attitude in all the employees so they can pay that type of corporate culture or company attitude? Yeah, and I think that's true for any company. Yeah. I mean, in order yeah. to get a brand to really come to life, every single employee has to, as they say, live the brand and really have it in their heart and soul. Well, what we find with the chocolate, doing a lot of in-store samplings, is people of all ages love the chocolate, but there's a fundamental audience that's going for us. One of my lectures in a class coming up is John Costello, who runs uh, marketing for the Home Depot. And I think John will tell you, was head of marketing at Sears also, introduced the softer side of Sears. Uh, he will tell you that you know, Lowe's, over the last few years, really has outperformed the Home Depot in terms of that in-store service, that friendliness. There was a time when a Home Depot employee would chase you out to the parking lot telling you how to install a faucet. And I think they lost some of that. And I think John will probably talk when he comes here about how he has to reinstill that into that, that to, to, to her point. It's absolutely that experience in that store, the attitude of those people mm -hmm. with the orange apron. How do they treat you? Mm -hmm. That is the personality of the Home Depot. And if you lose that, somebody will really come up behind you and make, make gains. Yeah. Southwest Airlines is probably an example of a Perfect. brand. Perfect. Great there. example. Yeah. yeah. They do the same thing. I think, I think it's really important. I think it's definitely increasing. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, Cadillac shipping. We, we're one of the largest dropshippers for Williams-Sonoma, Neiman Marcus, uh, maybe someday Red Envelope. And um, uh, we switched away from Styrofoam a couple years ago to a, a new product called Airliner, which is environment, which you know, takes up maybe 1% of the space of Styrofoam when we ship. And it's a huge selling point uh, when we go talk to, you know, we're, we're dealing with Starbucks right now. And they have a whole packaging department. You know, we're looking for biodegradable plastic to, sub to uh, use instead of our regular plastic <coughs> packages. But when they found out that we use the airliner, they're like, oh, you're the kind of company we want to work with. We were on when we were on Food Finds on the Food Network. 
uh, showing again March 26, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, <laughs> we spent, we, 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 we showed them, even though it had nothing to do with making the cakes, we showed them the package. So, and that was, that was actually part of the, you know, part, part of what made it on the air. So I think it's huge. I think I like fair trade coffee, um, uh, dolphin safe tuna. Sometimes it becomes a, literally a, an imperative. You either are in it. Procter & Gamble is, is even looking on the coffee side at, at, at being able to say, look, this is coffee that's purchased and, and grown under, under sustainable and, and proper conditions. So I think it's, uh, you look at what happens when, when people get in trouble with, with sweatshops on clothing outside mm -hmm. this country. Kathy Lee Gifford, I think, a few years ago. Or insider trading. Insider trading. Martha Stewart. We, we, we have, make it a point in our product listing, our ingredient list, any, any word, we won't use any ingredient that has three syllables or more except for chocolate. <laughs> I think the Internet is going to be incredibly powerful. We are just beginning to get this country broadband wired. We're pathetically behind. Uh, the nation of South Korea has uh, is got the most broadband wired households in the world, and it's like 20 megabits. Not, it's not a paltry, you know, one and a half, two. It opens up a whole new world of streaming video, of a, an ability to really instant on wireless networks in your home. Yeah, when I, you know, I think the best example is is, uh, is AdWords, a uh, Google, where the advertising is directly related to you, no wastage. Type in Miami vacation, boom, it's related to you. Addressable media. Uh, again, you guys in, in in the audience here, we're going to have a digital pipeline into the home soon. That's going to have your telecommunications, your voice communications, internet, <laughs> filmed entertainment, music, whole things that come in with with zeros and ones. One big pipe. I don't know who's going to own the pipe. But in, within that pipe, we're going to be able to insert commercials and really make those commercials on the fly designed for you. If you've got a child under 12 months in the home, you're getting Kimberly Clark Huggies commercials. If you don't, you're not. My favorite is the, the C-Bond dental adhesive. They buy news uh, programs trying to reach people with no teeth. I don't know how many people without teeth are watching the news programs, but that i got to believe, what is it, 98% wastage of people that don't need uh, dental adhesive? That kind of advertising is just, <laughs> it can't sustain itself. And what we're going to have with the Internet, I think, and permission marketing, is a communication and dialogue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this dessert line. I'm going to have people who want to know about it and who are going to get involved, and, and I'm, I'm going to you know, communicate with them. And that's where advertising is going and where you MBA students are going to spend your marketing life with advertising, not women 18 to 34, but one-to-one -one marketing to the individual level. We, we also see that we have some fanatics out there over our products, and, and through the Internet they can either on their own websites or contact through their own lists get the word out. So I think from an advocacy, the Internet would be great for just spreading the word. 